Hello and welcome to Green Pleat Talks. My name is Kate Armitage and I'm your host for today. I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Walters, Head of Consultancy and Customer Data Services at Lee's Plan, thinking forward to 2030, uh, when the ban for new ICE, ICE vehicles comes into place. What more needs to happen to ensure fleets transition to zero emission by the end of the decade? Um, I think fleets are transitioning and I think that most fleets are looking to go and go quickly. Um, I can't remember a conversation I've had certainly in the last 18 months where a fleet is waiting. The question is always how do we move? How do we move quicker? Um, the question was around certainty of taxation. Well we've got that now which is great. Um, investment in infrastructure is, is improving um, but that's certainly an area which could be improved further uh, and there's lots of studies going on at the moment. So Optimize Prime, for example, um, which, is, which is one that we're involved in, where they're, they're, they're kind of looking in the southeast to kind of say, well, where is the infrastructure need? What is people's behavioral patterns like? Um, rather than just throwing charge points all down motorways and, and, and charging stations, what do we actually need to do? Um, and I think, you know, we, we said before, there are, you know, there are circumstances now when people are moving towards EVs there, certain numbers of their employees perhaps can't go straight away and do need a, a, an interim stepping stone of a, of a, of a good plug-in in inverted commas for a couple of years until until things steady on the public access uh, networks but we're not finding that a barrier for adoption we're finding that fleets want to make that move and they want to make it now okay um you, you've mentioned recharging infrastructure yeah uh, and uh, we all know that uh, workplace charging and public charging is a big part of the electrification puzzle. Um, what would you like to see government and industry and local DNAs do to ensure that we have a reliable charging infrastructure in the coming years? Okay, so from a government perspective, um, I'd like to see legislation on price tariffs, um, so uniformity on public access charging, so how they do that, whether that's a subsidy in the background, I'm not, I'm not particularly worried. But knowing that when you turn up to a, a polar, obviously they've got the polar network uh, and the polar subscription service. But wherever you turn up with your contactless card or your fob or whatever you've got, there's some form of uniformity and regulation on pricing. I'd also like to see whether it's legislation or whether it's uh, commitment from the providers I think it probably needs to be some form of, of, of legislation as well. In terms of uptime, there's nothing more annoying than getting to your charging post um, and for them not to have flipped the switch that says it's inactive so that it's deactivated on the, on, on the network. Um, but I would also encourage uh, to, to, I would also be encouraging the DNOs and the organizations to look beyond motorways now. Um, obviously we've just seen the first very futuristic ultra chart ultra fast charging hub open up that's one solution but you know pockets of smaller charging hubs need to be thought about in more rural areas um, to allow people fleets organizations access and um, you know off grid should we say or, or off of the main arterial networks the central funding for infrastructure projects is there and it's not being tapped as it should be so local councils, and, and it, probably not at parish level, but local councils and county councils need to be doing more to understand locally what do they need to do. All of the focus at the moment is on plug-in vehicles, but when we talk about zero emission vehicles, we mm -hmm. do have to also consider hydrogen. We do. Um, what role does lease plan see hydrogen playing within fleets? So certainly, I think hydrogen is a, a larger part of the solution for the, the larger commercial vehicles. So what we're now seeing is like commercial vehicles, e-sprinter, e, e um, you know, e-veto, that kind of level of seven point five ton is quite well, is, is becoming quite well provided for. But there is an elephant in the room, which is our commercial vehicles, our, our big commercial vehicles, our HGVs, for example. Um, and that electrification is not the right method for those. So, you know, Germany is looking at uh, overhead pylons, for example, 
um, as, a, as a there's, there's a trial ongoing in some of the auto barns at the moment. So similar to the trains that you've seen, um, they'll have a pop-up uh, charging bar that comes up. Very futuristic. I'm not, I'm not sure we'll ever get there on, on our motorways, to be honest with you. So I think hydrogen has a really big role to play. Um, personally, I think hydrogen will always be second fiddle uh, for our passenger cars. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is it's not something you can readily have at home. Um, I certainly wouldn't want some form of uh, hydrogen pump in my, in, in my, you know, or hydrogen tank somewhere near me, which means that you're still reliant on going to a fuel station of some shape, way, or formal description. Uh, so we've, we've talked about hydrogen and we are thinking forward. Um, uh, something that is uh, synonymous with new vehicle technology is connected and autonomous vehicles. Okay. Should we be expecting a, a something something exciting in, in the connected autonomous world soon? And, and, you know, what should fleets be looking out for? I think the biggest problem with autonomous is still getting over the legal, ethical, moral, um, AI dilemma, if you will, of a, of a car. How does an electric car decide what to hit, whether it hits the car in front or whether it rears off to avoid the accident? So could I see autonomous on the main arterial roads uh, for, you know, relatively quickly, you know, two to five years? Yeah, probably. But in a city? No, I think, I think we've got a quite a way to go, in, if, I'm, if I'm perfectly honest. What's more excited is the connected space. So if I think that my phone in the morning, it knows where I'm going, or it did when I was able to go anywhere. Um, it knows where I'm going because it can see my diary. Um, so it will already tell me about the traffic, you know, and, and what's going on. Well, in, in most of the electric, you know, the new electric cars, that connected space then fits into your sat nav. So it knows where you're going. Um, it knows how much charge you've got. So it will already know that you're going to need to charge at some point. But the next step, the next logical step, is where something happens to a car in front of you on the motorway, for example. So the connected bit on the charge points needs to work properly, i.e. when a charge point goes down, that was the one that you were aiming for, it needs to change automatically. Because that's coming, I'd say yeah. it's probably 12 to 18 months. Yeah. But the other or, bit where... Or occupied. Or occupied, indeed. Yeah. Um, I think the other one though, so say for example, I'm in an accident in, in my car, um, my car will automatically then contact the emergency services, but it will also tell all of the other connected cars behind me that I've been in an accident and there's going to be a problem. So traffic is going to start. So avoid, avoid me because I've just had an accident. Yeah. So when cars are talking to cars, talking to infrastructure, talking to gantries, talking to the road surfaces, that is a very exciting space. And that's, that's not sci-fi, that we're not in Blade Runner territory. Um, that's, that's just around the corner. Uh, Matt, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you Me so too. much for your, your insight. And um, that is about all we've got time for. Thank you for joining Greenfleet Talks. Uh, please tune in to Greenfleet 365 again soon.